Hello, welcome to another episode of Jim's Love the Garden. most certainly tell it's the weekend. Uh, it's been dry and sunny pretty much all week. We get to Saturday and it's done nothing but chuck it down so far. So what I'm going to do is just quickly go through some um, comments with you and then I'm going to show you the greenhouse. I've got a couple of issues um, forming in the greenhouse so I just quickly want to show you. Um, obviously blight again. And um, so I'll, what I'll do is I'll just go through the comments. I've had loads of comments come through with regard to potatoes and stuff like that. Um, I know a lot of you have um, responded. So I've, I've started to put all that together. But if you have, um, if you do want to put some comments in for your potato crop this year, um, you know, please do so. Because what, what I'll do is in the next um, comment section, if you like, what I'll do is I'll put all the potato stuff together there. I have had uh, quite a variety of sort of comments come back. People... Um, suffering with blight and eelworm this year. Now we were told at the beginning of the year because of the conditions we had over um, sort of last year and over the winter uh, that there was going to be quite a lot of slugs about so I'm not surprised we've had so much eelworm problem. I've had a few eelworm um, getting into my potatoes um, and uh, I, know, I know some of the others have you know from comments and that and also because of the the dry um, August that we had, the blight was late. However, in September, in the UK at least, we had a reasonable amount of rain um, towards the beginning of September. And that's caused a late um, a bit of blight going through as well. So um, I know we've had some, you know, some people have had some good results of potatoes and others have had average or, or, or even they've lost crops. But um, please do put your comments below and um, I'll... Um, Pull all them together, but what I want to do now is just the other comments that have come through over the past couple of weeks. So the first um, comment comes from Jane um, Jane Kelly, um, and this is regard to the uh, comments about runner beans. Um, and basically, I um, I put quite a lot of beans in this year. I I always typically do put a lot of runner beans in. Um, I think I've got um, I think there's eighty odd, so there's hundred and sixty. Um, canes in there and I've got a couple of plants going up which one so you can there's like 300 odd um, runner bean plants growing and um, so I've had a lot of runner beans and I've there's there's a lot on the plant now where I've basically filled my freezer already so I've got 40 50 kilos in the green uh, in the in the um, sorry in the freezer um, so what I've been doing is picking them as I um, you know been going on really to you know eat them fresh however having said that whilst I was on holiday um, you know quite a lot came um, I was going on holiday around the end of um, August and um, in that week um, there was quite a glut that come. The week before I went I completely stripped the plants and there was only sort of um, beans that were sort of, I don't know, a couple of inches long. When I came back they'd already grown and run to seed so um, I'm going to have a lot of seed. Now, Jenny's, um, uh, sorry, Jane Kelly's um, comment was that you can actually use the, the, the seeds, the bean seed, um, in stews and stuff like that. Now I know I have had comments in the past from um, from allotment upcycling, um, um, where they also um, use the beans and seeds. So I will try that. I've never tried it before, but what I'll do is I will try it this year. During the winter months, I do um, grow uh, grow vegetables to make stews out of. So what I will be doing is making some vegetable stews, um, and what I'll do is I'll put some beans in just to try them out, see what they're like. But um, I'm not quite sure how to cook them. What I'll do is I'll just put them in with the rest of the vegetables and sort of boil them up and see what happens. But uh, I'll let you know how I get on. But yes, if you have had a lot of um, runner bean seeds, um, more than you need, which is probably the same as me, um, what you can do is dry them as normal and then put them into your cooking and, and obviously, uh, you know, sort of use them in your cooking, like for chilies or for stews or whatever. So that's one. Uh, the next one, a um, couple of comments from Brian Hubbery. Um, First one he was saying about the club root in the compost. Now, 
Just to, just to explain, this actually comes from last year. I had club root in some of the brassicas last year, and um, the I have had club root when I first adopted this allotment. Uh, there was um, there was a bit of club root in some of the areas of the uh, the allotment, so I needed to be careful. So the first year I had this allotment to make. Um, because I wasn't sure if there was any problems with the ground, what I did do is rather than growing the vegetables in blocks, what I did do, uh, which is perhaps a good bit of advice, is um, what I did is I put a brassica every couple of metres, you know, so I had a few brassicas, so I just put them all, all over the allotment basically, mixed them amongst the other vegetables, just to see if there was any club roots in the ground. And I did find that there's a couple of sections that had club root. So what I did is actually for three years I grew no brassicas at all uh, in the allotment. And then, um, and then what I did is I grew them where I knew there wasn't club root before. And then after about six years I then grew brassicas everywhere. And I've had no signs of club root really um, for oh, a good four or five years. Last year um, I had two rows of um, brassicas. I think they were... Um, they were uh, um, broccoli that, that, that actually had the problem, if I remember correctly. And only the broccoli had club root. Now, I know you can't get it through the seed. Um, club root doesn't come in the seed. Um, so the only thing it could have been was either it was in the ground or it was in the compost that I um, put the seed in. Now, the compost that I used uh, was a different uh, top than I normally use. And... Um, so all of the other brassicas, because obviously I, I grow um, a couple of different types of kale, I grow purple sprouting broccoli, um, I grow uh, normal green broccoli, um, and also last year I'd got another brassica. Um, and basically they were all free of club root, except for the, the, uh, the, the calabrese, the green broccoli. And the only difference with them compared to everything else was the compost. So I drew the conclusion that the, that the club root was in the compost. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but um, um, Brian's comment was, if, the, if you get the compost hot enough, that will kill all the spores off that are in there, that are, that are the club root spores. And, um, and he was saying he's not sure about um, some of the, uh, the compost supplies, how hot they get the compost, and does that kill the spores off. I could only I could only go by what was different between that and everything else. Um, now, to be honest with you, I'm I'm pretty sure that I had no club root in the ground, and um, these showed most well. They did have club root most certainly, um, and the only thing that was different was they were they were grown in this compost. So I think that's probably um, where it came from. Um, Brian also said that I had um, I made a comment about frost-free greenhouse. This greenhouse is not heated. Um, as such, so it's not like a um, like a heated greenhouse as you would expect. You know, it's got heaters in it and all the rest of it. But what I do do is I I try to keep this greenhouse frost free. And the way I do that is um, I've shown this trick before. But basically, what I do is I'll put a um, a plant pot with a um, um, a candle in the middle of it. So if I if I know it's going to be a frosty evening um, in the winter and I've got plants in here, what I do is I put a um, a candle inside a pot. On the on the floor in the middle, and then I put a, a plant pot over the top of that, and then a plant pot over the top of that. So bigger, and, and these are all uh, the pitcher, you know, clay made pots. And what happens is the candle will burn inside there, and it heats the pot up, and then the pot will then give off heat um, during the night, and it will keep the greenhouse frost free. Obviously, I have a thermo, um, um, what do you call it, temperature gauge in the greenhouse. And uh, that tells me that the, that the temperature will go down to, I don't know, 3, 2 degrees or something like that, but it's frost-free. Um, so that, that's basically all I do. There are other means of obviously heating greenhouses um, other than doing that, but I find that that's the cheapest way of doing it basically up here. Uh, what you can do is you can also have a, a single light bulb, just a 5 watt light bulb or something like that, in a pot. Um, and, and, and run a wide to greenhouse and that is very low energy and that will also keep it frost free but uh, you know it is a cold temperature but it's not fr uh, it doesn't freeze inside the greenhouse that's the point I'm trying to make um, the next one he was saying um, hitting my head on cucumbers now I've got a couple of cucumbers still growing believe it or not I've got one here which is um, growing and there's a little teeny one here growing 
but just above the uh, the camera here, there's, 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 there's quite a big one. And he said, I'm surprised you don't hit your head on cucumbers. I do actually hit my head on cucumbers. And if you look at some of the videos from last year, uh, there was quite a few of them growing around here. And every time I came into the greenhouse, I was banging my head on the greenhouse. And yes, I did have to edit some of them out as I was walking in. But uh, but yes, the cucumbers haven't been brilliant this year, to be honest with you. Um, I've had a couple of plants damp off whilst I was on holiday, and uh, I normally get about um, I normally get about six or seven or eight cucumbers per plant, and I've got six plants in. So as you can imagine, I normally get 40, 50 cucumbers out of the greenhouse. This year I've had about, I've had less than, I can't remember the exact number, but so far I've actually had less than 20 cucumbers this year, so it's not been a brilliant year for cucumbers. Not quite sure why, they've been planted in exactly the same way, watered in exactly the same way. I've had a few damp off, um, which is unfortunate, but uh, for some reason this year they've not grown particularly well. I've had quite a lot of um, leave, leaves um, being burnt, I think it was quite a bit bright for them. So a lot of the leaves kind of went uh, like this, where you get them sort of going brown. And that's basically sun scorch, where, the, where it's got a bit too bright for it. And that damages the leaves, and I think that's possibly one of the problems I've had this year. But uh, I'm getting dripped on it. Um, anyway, uh, the next question um, or comment comes from... So I've, I've got all the potato ones here as well, so I'm just working my way through. Um, Victoria Holmstrom from Sweden and she was saying about the um, I made a comment about the alpine strawberries. Alpine strawberries are the wild wild type of strawberries and you get little teeny strawberries only about the size of your um, sort of little finger and um, if you've got a bit of space even if you haven't got a garden and you've got uh, just a windowsill or a um, or a, a balcony or something like that these are well worth throwing and I'll, I'll just bring you in just out here So I planted these um, about two years ago, and uh, all they are is they're in a um, in a in a tray, and all I did is just sprinkle the seed on the tray. There's other bits and bobs growing in here now, but uh, what I will do is tidy these out a little bit. Uh, but as you can see, there's a there's a strawberry there, and you get you get sort of one or two a week on there, but they are really nice. They're not the best looking strawberries in the world, to be honest with you. Um, they're a little bit. Um, they can get, uh, come on, come on. They can get, um, you know, they look a bit shriveledy and small and stuff like that. But they taste absolutely fantastic. So uh, if you have, if I've never planted them in the ground, and uh, they are supposed to be kind of, uh, they are a perennial plant. But in Britain, because of the frosts and stuff like that, they are classed as an annual because they typically die in the frost. But um, I've, as I say, I planted them three years ago and they're still living and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. What I will do is, um, if they're still growing next spring, I'll pop them up into bigger pots and um, try and grow them on because they've been in that compost now for three years. Uh, but um, alpines um, don't typically like too much food anyway. But um, I think they're I think they're about due to be repotted to one But yes, the comment was, if you have got a bit of space, um, you don't need much space. You know, even if you've just got a pot or something like that, Put some um, um, alpine strawberries. They come in in a, in a seed packet. The, the seeds are quite cheap, and um, and you get little little strawberries off there, which are really nice. Uh, I did have another comment from Brian Hubbard, and he was saying that he actually grows um, white alpine strawberries, and he says they're really nice as well to grow. I've never grown any white ones. I've only ever grown the red ones. But uh, as I say, well worthwhile. So do um, do. Um, do plant some alpine strawberries if you've got a little bit of room and they'll what I do in the during the year during the summer they're outside just on just outside the greenhouse and then during the winter I'll bring them into the greenhouse and just put them on the side and just keep them damp over the winter and then you know sort of take them in and out so obviously during the winter you haven't got your straw uh, your tomatoes and stuff in the greenhouse so um, you know you've got a bit of room in here so you can just put them in here during the winter keep them damp and then in the spring, put them back outside and then you'll get strawberries all year round. Okay, so the, the pumpkin crop. Now, there was obviously five pumpkins, but what I've done, one of them has already gone to, um, gone to a friend. Um, so basically what I've done, I've, I've just measured um, these pumpkins. This one at this end here, that's... Uh, 
weighing in at 19.6 kilos. Uh, the one next to it, which is the biggest one, that's 25 kilos. Um, this one here is um, 15 kilos, and the one at the end is 15.9 kilos. So, really out out of them, they've done really well. Uh, the one that I gave away was a bit smaller than that, so it's probably around 12 kilos. So, um, but but yeah, I've been really pleased with the pumpkins this year. As you can see, this one here, uh, to give you an idea, that's my hand next to it. So you can see it's about. From there to there is probably about um, probably about 19 inches or so from you know from side to side, um, and it is you know it is a good size. What I will do is I've got a tape measure up here. I'll just measure actually how big they are. Okay, so we'll just quickly measure this one here. It's easier said than done when you've got a metal tape measure, but that's. Pretty much 50, 54 inches in diameter. This one's probably a bit less because it's this one's tall. Yep. Yeah, about 55 again. I do about the same. Uh, and this smaller one over here, you can just about see it. About 46 inches. So. The smaller two are about 46 and the larger two are about 55 inches in diameter. So all in all, I'm quite pleased with the uh, the pumpkins this year. As you know, last year I didn't get a particularly good crop. They were quite small and um, didn't grow particularly well. But, uh, but these ones have done really well this year and I'll definitely be growing the same seeds next year. Okay, so a quick update on the ochre. As you can see, it's still still growing really well, but um, we have had a few flowers on it, and uh, it's uh, the flowers have sort of died off now. But uh, as you can see, it's it's kind of wrapping itself around. I don't know if you can see that, but it's all sort of wrapping round and round in there. But uh, I think this um, this carrot bed, as it's normally um, used for, has worked out quite well for the uh, the ochre because it keeps it contained because this can sort of spread all over the place. But uh, that's what the ochre looks like. There has been a couple of branches like this one here that haven't looked particularly healthy. Uh, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, that one's obviously been knocked there. Um, but uh, it's looked a bit kind of, I don't know, looked a bit sorry for itself. But uh, the rest of it's um, growing really healthily. So I'm really looking forward to digging this up as soon as we have a frost and it starts to die down. I'll um, dig this up and I'll show you what the crop looks like. Okay, really quick update on the um, birdhouse gourd. As you can see, the plant's really starting to die back now. Um, there's a little bit of mildew coming on the leaves, which is not a lot I can do about that, to be honest with you. But you can see this kind of white powdery um, bit on the leaf, and uh, there's these sort of black spots forming. I think that's a bit of mildew. It looks like mould. Uh, these leaves here, as you can see, are starting to go over, but the, the fruits are doing really well, so I'll be picking the fruits off before too much longer. So that's the two on that plant, um, looking pretty good. Um, on this plant here, we've got, just on the side of the gate, we've got this large one at the back here, um, which has done quite well. Again, this plant is starting to die back. Um, we've got this one here, which has looked more like a bottle than a sort of bird out of the pointy top on it, but that's doing quite well. The, the rest of the, the vine, as you can see, going up there, that's really starting to die back, even though there's some little gourds at the top. Um, the actual vine itself here has uh, really started to die back. So um, that one, I think, is just about finished. And just up the front here, um, on the fruit frame, um, as you can see, there's loads and loads of um, smaller gourds forming. That's just a bit of bruising weight knocked against the uh, the metalwork there, but there's a nice sized one here, uh, which is quite possibly one of the biggest ones there, to be honest with you. Um, there's one there that looks very much like an apple. No, I'm joking, that's the apple tree. Um, but you can see there's lots of little small ones, and if you can see that one through there, um, that are forming. And it's a shame because they're quite late in the season, um, so I don't think anything's going to come off them. They've, they've obviously pollinated because they've, you know, they've grown on. Um, this one here, we've got this sort of smallish one here, um, which is probably about, about four to five inches across. Um, I don't know how much bigger that's going to get, but what I'm going to do is leave these on the plant to see how they grow. Uh, there's this one here, that's probably about, I don't know, about five, five, five and a half inches across. 
uh, but that's growing quite nicely. And this just goes to show how much um, the, the tension in this little tendril here that's coming off and holding onto there, that's like a guitar string, it's that taut. And that's holding all of the weight of this um, birdhouse gourd there. So it's, it's surprising how much, how strong these things are and how much weight they actually carry. Um, there's no more gourd on here. They've all, they've all sort of, I don't know, rotted off because they haven't pollinated. Some little ones here, but I don't think anything's going to come in them now. Obviously, we're into October now, pretty much. So, um, and this one here is quite. A, I'll just get this out so you can see. So that's quite a nice sized one. Um, and then at the end here, we've got the big one, which I've shown you before. So that one there is really nice. I'll pull that round so that you could get a bit of sun. As you can see, that's uh, that's done really well. And there is one other one hiding in there, which has come in the last few weeks. Uh, but again, I don't know how, how big they're going to get. There's lots of little ones for me. And it's a real shame because this time of year, obviously the plant's trying to uh, produce a few more fruit, but um, um, unfortunately the weather's going to turn in the next few weeks and uh, they're not going to be able to develop anything like um, the others have done. But uh, what we'll do um, in a few weeks' time, when, the, when this... Um, when this vine does start to um, die back, what I'll do is I'll take the fruit, I'll, I'll leave them on as long as I possibly can do. But obviously as soon as the vine starts to die back, you know, they're not going to get that much bigger. And we'll see what we've got. But I can see there's evidence here as well of um, a bit of mildew forming on the leaves um, on there. So, uh, you know, I think the I think the vine's days are numbered really. But you can see there's the sort of um, gourds all the way along really, um, of various sizes. But... Uh, Anyway, what I'll do is I'll give you an update um, in a week or so, or a couple of weeks' time, when I pick them, and I'll uh, be able to show you what, uh, what crop we've got out of uh, the seven plants that we've put in. Okay, so a quick update in the greenhouse. As you can see, uh, the tomato plants are looking a bit sorry for themselves, and uh, the dogs running through them as well. Quite. Um, I have got still a bit of blight um, in the greenhouse, as you can see, that's, uh, that's a fungal blight there um, on that stem. And also these tomatoes here are clearly suffering from blight. Uh, I just left them in there. What I'd normally do is take these straight out, but I just wanted to show you. So this whole plant really is suffering from it. And uh, these tomatoes aren't going aren't gonna to do anything, so I might as well just take this plant out. And you can see what it's done. It's actually, the plant's actually picked the problem up from outside because that stalk there is going outside and that's gone all the way through the plant and that's why it's coming out on the fruit. So I think it's actually entered the plant at the top and it's worked its way down through the plant because you can see evidence of it all over the plant. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm basically going to get all the tomatoes out um, today really. So what I'm going to do is strip all of these tomatoes off. Um, they're not going to get any any bigger or riper than this. Now, even the green ones like these, I'm also going to do the same with these. What I'm going to do is take them all off the plants, and I'm going to boil them up like I did the last lot, and, and I'm going to make tomato sauce with them, which is used for like a, uh, like a passata, which I use in curries, chilies, and all that kind of stuff. So all I do is basically um, get the get the tomatoes. Um, I quickly, uh, well, I get the um, potato masher, um, but basically just break them up. I don't bother chopping them. I just sort of smash them up with the uh, potato chopper. I'll even put some green ones in there as well, there's no reason why you can't eat green tomatoes. Um, put all them in the um, into a uh, into a big pot, boil them down for around an hour, an hour and a half, um, simmer them down till the sauce starts to thicken and then uh, just box that up and then put that in the freezer and then I can be using that um, over the next few months. Now as you can see there's loads of tomatoes um, so what I'm going to be doing, I've, I've got a little bit of blight down there, I don't know if you can see, I'll just zoom in, that tomato there is showing signs of blight. So I've got nothing to gain from leaving these in here now, so what I'm going to do is just take all of these out, um, any of the green ones, I might leave some of these on windowsills and stuff to, um, to ripen, but uh, because there's so much blight in here now, um, I, I, I can't stop the spread out any longer, so what I'm going to do is take all the tomatoes out, and then take the plants out and ditch the plants, get those into the recycling bin, and then that'll be uh, that'll be it. Any of the any of the green ones, what I'll do then is put them on a windowsill, or actually just boil them up with the red ones and uh, make the tomato sauce with them. Um, from the chilies, um, as you can see, um, there's there's loads of these are the jalapeno chilies, and these have done really well this year. Um, we have we have had quite a few um, 
chilies already but um, as you can see there's plenty more to go in there uh, and they're all up here as well they grow right up into the roof there's some smaller ones up there which will come a bit later but what I'm also going to do with these is um, I'm going to harvest a lot of these um, over the next few days and what I'm going to do is just chop them up uh, quite finely and I'm going to freeze them and then as I'm making chilies or whatever I can just take them out of the um, take them out of the freezer and um, you know and then just get a bit out of the bag and then put that into the cooking so they'll do quite nicely these are the um, these are the um, the lemon um, lemon chilies the hot the, the hot lemon peppers um, and what I'm going to do exactly the same thing with these I'm going to take all of the red ones off and then uh, sorry the the yellow ones off sorry and then chop those up and also freeze those as you can see I've got quite a few other jalapenos growing over here um, so what I'm going to do is, is harvest most of these now, leaving the smaller ones on. Now what I'm going to try to do, which is what I've, I haven't done this before, what I'm going to try to do is overwinter these um, chilli chili plants. Um, I don't know if, they're going to, if it's going to be successful, but I'm going to give it a go. I've never overwintered chilli plants before, uh, but what I'm going to do is um, overwinter them and see if they'll grow again next year. If not, I can just plant some more seed. But uh, So that's what the chilies look like. The ginger isn't as good as it was last year um, I'm not quite sure but the uh, the um, the leaves look a bit kind of I don't know shriveled up and stuff like that I don't know if it's been too hot in here for it or or what but it's it's nowhere near as good as it was last year but um, I'm going to be getting that out in the next few weeks so I'll I'll show you what that looks like but some of the some of the gingers only just started to come through um, but uh, what I'll do is I'll be digging that up and um, I'm going to look see what that uh, that looks like in a couple of weeks' time, so I'll, I can be able to show you. But now the weather's cooling down, there's a marked difference in the garden over the last couple of weeks. You know, the plants are starting to die back, and so what I want to do is um, get this out before it starts to spoil. Cucumber-wise, as you can see, um, there's a, there's a there's a good cucumber here. Um, and there's another one just 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 forming here. Um, but you know, as I said in the comments section, you know, the cucumbers have not been as good this year as they've been in past years. Um, I'm about I'm going about probably about 50% of what I normally do. I'm not sure if this one's going to come to anything. Um, there's another little one here as well. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to come to anything. But um, but yeah, the, the, the cucumbers um, haven't done anywhere near as well this year as they normally do. But, um, I, you know, as I say, I think that's because we've had such a bright year, you know, sun-wise. Um, you know, I've had a lot of scorching on the leaves and that. And um, I think that's uh, that's 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 played a played a part in not being so um, so good. The um, these are the um, um, broccoli plants that got absolutely nailed by um, caterpillars. And actually, when I came in the other day, I thought they'd actually been attacked again because these leaves are starting to look a bit like they've been nobbled again. But I've not been able to find any caterpillars on the plant. But um, what I'm planning to do is um, plant those out. I really don't think they're going to come to anything, but I thought I'd give it a go anyway. But uh, anyway, those are the, cuc uh, the, the, the broccoli plants, and um, these are the tomato pla uh, strawberry plants. Can't get it right at the minute. Uh, the strawberry plants that I've potted up the other day, obviously these are growing quite nicely. And um, so that's pretty much what the greenhouse looks like at the moment. Obviously there's not a lot going on, but uh, it's all about um, stripping it all out now and um, getting these tomatoes cooked and um, taking out the tomato plants out of the greenhouse because of this blight problem that I've got. Um, you know, I really do need to get all this out of the way. So the raspberries have been absolutely non-stop this year, as you can see, you know, into uh, almost October now. And, uh, you know, we're still getting really good raspberries. And we've had the, the yellow ones and the red ones, and they've been pretty much fruiting excuse me they've been pretty much fruiting since um, right at the, well the back end of May start of June and as I say it's almost October now so they've been fruiting pretty much non-stop all that time and we're still getting plenty of fruit off so the raspberries have done really well this year so I hope this episode has been some use to you please don't hesitate to point your comments or questions you've got below and I'll always get back to you and I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Top Garden